It's Thursday, September 5. Good afternoon. I am Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. Prime Minister Andrew Holness this morning declared a state of a public emergency for Clarendon and St. Catherine. The announcement follows appeals for the security forces to deal with high levels of crime in Clarendon. The Governor General has so declared that a state of public emergency exists in the communities specified in the schedule, that is to say, the entire area comprising the parishes of Clarendon and St. Catherine. This proclamation of a state of public emergency shall remain in force unless revoked for a period of 14 days. And for more on the state of emergency in Clarendon and St. Catherine, let's join TVJ's Herman Green. Well, the state of emergency took effect at 6 o'clock this morning for both parishes. Prime Minister Andrew Holness, as well as National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang, and the High Command of both security forces made the announcement earlier today right here at Jamaica House. Now, in justifying the need for this state of emergency, they pointed to the ongoing crime figures in Clarendon. But also in St. Catherine, uh, Commission of Police, Major General Anthony Anderson, pointed to the numbers in both North, Northern and Southern Police Divisions in St. Catherine. The St. Catherine South Police Division has seen an increase in murders of 50% over last year's number to currently sit at 91 murders since the beginning of the year. St. Catherine North Division, while experiencing a reduction of 14% over last year, still has had 66 murders this year so far. Now, with several states of emergency across the island, the question was raised about how stretched the security forces are, as well as how effective these measures have been over the time, and will Clarendon St. Catherine SOE be effective? I'll have the responses to these later in primetime news. From Jamaica House, I'm Herman Green, TVJ News. In the meantime, Mayor of Maypen, Winston Mirage, has reacted to the declaration of a state of a public emergency for Clarendon. I'm happy for this announcement. Um, some will say it's long overdue. Uh, I'll say it's timely. Yes, we could have maybe saved a couple of lives if it was um, announced before. But since it is today, then we welcome it. And I'd just like to urge the citizens of Clarendon to cooperate with the security forces as they carry out their duties. Mr. Maraj says citizens have been looking over their shoulders for quite some time due to the increase in murders. These people have been worried, you know, everybody is just looking over their shoulders, looking around on a, on a time and basis every day. And, and so I'm sure that the business community are very happy for this announcement. I just like the business people to come on board and give whatever information they have to the security forces as well. Because I'm sure a lot of them have information that, and they are too coward, you know, I'm scared to talk to the security forces. But now is the time to speak up and to ensure that, you know, whatever concerns they had are dealt with. In other news, coffee farmers in Portland are upset about the price they are being paid for the crop. One farmer, Christopher Thomas, argues that the price per box is basically running them out of business. A box of coffee was selling for twelve thousand dollar box, and right now, a three thousand dollar I come down to. A box of coffee can buy a bag of fertilizer, and. A butter with a butter. A butter with butter. We now can have a farm, you know. And it's bad now, man. It needs to send our school. It needs to send our school. It's that the returns from his business prevent him from employing workers to pick the coffee. When you take two men or three men going to your coffee farm now, much, much a box you can't pay them to pick. Out of the $3,000. It's bad, man. And them, we don't have nobody to talk. You know, see, we have to just go and turn a beer with we, 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 we them at the way, with the coffee. Another farmer, Michael Thompson, says while the farmers are disgruntled, they do not want to take it to the streets, but they are not sure what to do. And when we talk 
the people must say it's not the government response we coffee. Mr. Thompson feels the government can help by freeing up the market. Well, right now, we need some help from the government. Them look some market or otherwise free up the business that the farmer then can export them one coffee themselves. Make we get the license that we can do it yourself. Right? Because the man them who buy the coffee them rich already, you know. So what happened to your coffee them they respond in the business? After months of protests, work on the Tucker Main Road in St. James has begun. Residents were pleasantly surprised when crews from the National Works Agency came in the area last week. Details in this report. It has been a decade-old problem. Bad roads in Tucker St. James. Residents have taken to the streets on several occasions, complaining not only about the road condition, but the dusk. However, the first sight of heavy-duty equipment recently coming into the area brought some semblance of relief to the frustrated citizens. Right now, we can't park, we can't drive it, mud the the road, everything. So finally, we're glad now all the road are fixed, so we can be at ease. Guess what? I pay Chris Vika to drive on road these last days. And you know, say, if we don't have good road, you can cost the owners them a lot of money if you fix the front end parts. Both back end and front end, it will cost a lot of money. And them a road that can't fix with pure mall, they have used enough stone for it. I do the patrol them today, the dust is a major issue. You understand? People them in their house and them thing there, and they're not sick. You see me? I have two down at the yard, and I know say, regular I have to move them out. Because the dust, you can't tell where the dust are walk to, but the dust is there. You know what I'm saying? So we're glad it starts right now. National Works Agency Community Relations Officer Janelle Ricketts gave details about the scope of work for the project. It will be undertaken in three phases. This, the first phase will focus on the section between the Fairfield Bridge and the Taylor Avenue. The second phase of the project will see works being undertaken along the Taylor Avenue section onto Friendship. And then the third section of this program will see works beyond that section all the way up to Herlock Bridge. The first phase of the project should be completed by the end of the year. Residents are being urged to obey posted warning signs for their safety. Uh, as of now, we have closed off a section between the Fairfield Bridge and the intersection with the, the Irwin community. And from time to time, persons are still driving through this particular section. Shannon Press use TVJ News. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. More stories right after these messages. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Daryl Vaz, says the Caribbean Climate Change Partnership with Japan has been tackling some of Jamaica's challenges. We have details in this report. It has been beneficial. That's how Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Daryl Vaz, has described the implementation of the Japan-Caribbean Climate Change Partnership. The project was launched in 2016, geared towards tackling several challenges of climate change in vulnerable communities across Jamaica. He was speaking at a function hosted by the United Nations Development Program recently. According to Mr. Vaz, two targets that were met under the program are sustainable agriculture and water resources. Under the project, we have experienced a strengthened multi-sectoral focal point network for advancing climate action. We have collaborated with key stakeholders to develop a national appropriate mitigation action for water, for the water sector in Jamaica. We have provided training and awareness raising in climate change adaptation and mitigation principles and practices through various means of information exchange. Pilot demonstration projects under the JCCP were done in three major communities over a three-year period. The total cost of the JCCP's project is valued at $78 billion. Actions in these pilot demonstration projects cut across ministries and sectors to bring maximum benefit to Jamaicans as a community level. These include water harvesting infrastructure complemented with training in various aspects of climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies at over 70 locations island-wide which offer secondary and vocational training. Some 50 farmers in St. Anne 
have been direct recipients of rainwater harvesting, infrastructure, and awareness raising of the negative effects of climate change on their livelihoods and training in strategies to combat these negative effects. Meanwhile, Mr. Vance is urging the government to invest in similar partnerships in an effort to mitigate climate change challenges. Now is it time to invest in improved climate resilient agricultural techniques and forestry enterprises. It is important for us to scale up the technologies and actions as demonstrated under the JCCCP project. Now is it time to build supply chains and infrastructure that are resilient to disasters and climate variability so that the country will again gain competitive advantage in the decades to come. O'Shea Masters, TVJ News. Rising waters have become a major concern for North and South Carolina as Hurricane Dorian tracks closer to the U.S. coast today. Flooding has already been reported in low-lying areas. Details from the CNN. Downgraded to a Category 2, but that is still nothing, uh, nothing to sneeze at and certainly should not be ignored. Now, especially when you consider how little the winds actually dropped, we only went from 115 to 110 miles per hour, a difference of five miles per hour. But that threshold between a category two and three falls within that. So that's why you're seeing it go down to a category two. But again, it's a difference of five miles per hour. Trust me, 110 miles per hour is just as capable as 115 to knock trees down, power lines, all of those issues. So again, this is still a very serious storm. Forward movement still north northeast at eight miles per hour. It is getting so close to land and when we say it we mean the center of circulation which is what they would deem a technical landfall so the question is does it make landfall today in south carolina or do we have to wait until tomorrow when it crosses over north carolina before we see a technical landfall declared here's a look at the brand new track that just came in at the top of the 11 o'clock hour again they have pushed these products back down to a category two since the storm has weakened some but again keep in mind all throughout the day tomorrow we we still expect it to maintain that category two strength. So this isn't necessarily going to be a huge trend where we're dropping that wind speed every couple of hours. It's really going to hold its own here for at least the next 12 to 24 hours. Tornadoes are one of the growing concerns for this area today. We're talking areas of North and South Carolina. This tornado watch in effect through the afternoon hours. We've already had over a dozen tornado warnings so far today. Here Still overseas, the Hong Kong protest movement is expected to continue despite the chief executive finally withdrawing the extradition bill. Once again, we turn to the CNN for more. Hong Kong's embattled chief executive Carrie Lam fronted the media a day after announcing that she would finally withdraw her highly contentious extradition bill that has plunged the city into three months of protests and its worst political crisis. 62-year-old Lam reiterated her decision to give in to the protesters' key demand to formally withdraw the bill, saying she hoped this concession would be a step towards initiating dialogue with protesters to try and find a solution. The bill will be withdrawn. There will be no debate and no voting. The withdrawal of the bill, which would have allowed for extradition to mainland China, is only one of five demands by the protesters. The other demands include an independent inquiry into police brutality, the rioting claim to be revoked, for those arrested to be released and for universal suffrage to be granted. Many protesters say Lam's announcement is too little too late, that all demands must be met and that this move will not stop the demonstrations or quell the violence that has increased in recent weeks where hardline protesters have hurled bricks and petrol bombs at police, setting barricades on fire, while police have fired tear gas, rubber bullets and water cannons at demonstrators. More than 1,100 people have so far been arrested. Many have been charged with rioting, which carries a maximum sentence of 10 years jail. Some commentators believe the decision to withdraw the bill is an attempt by Beijing to defuse the crisis before the 1st of October National Day celebrations, marking the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. But with demonstrations planned for the coming days and weeks, the protests in Hong Kong are unlikely to end anytime soon. And in sports, the West Indies women's cricket team will be without opening batter Hayley Matthews for the opening one-day international against Australia this afternoon at the Coolidge Cricket Ground in Antigua. 
According to a Cricket West Indies release sent this morning, Matthews has been withdrawn from the squad for the upcoming series after she was charged for breaching the CWI Code of Conduct following an incident that took place on Wednesday in Antigua. The matter has been referred to the CWI Disciplinary Tribunal. The CWI Interim Selection Panel has named Shanita Grimond as a replacement. The second and third ODIs will be on September 5 and 8 at the Sir Vivian Richards Cricket Ground. The ODI series will count as points towards qualification for the 2021 Women's Cricket World Cup. Match time is 1 p.m. A three-match T20 series will follow on September 14, 16 and 18 at the Kensington Oval in Barbados. And that's the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. We have news next at 7 o'clock. That's primetime news. And on behalf of our news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.